to kick this off, we thought it would be very good to begin, in fact, not only did we think it, Senator Rockefeller insisted on it, that we have a good hour-long conversation about the keys to successful grant writing. Uh, not anchored in any one particular federal program, but just generally, what are the keys to success as you go to identify the resources that you need to move your community forward? And to lead that discussion, uh, we have asked Dr. Jeff Schwartz, who is the Education Program Manager for ARC. Uh, Jeff has been at ARC for uh, going on 12 years now. Uh, he has uh, experience in a variety of uh, education venues from being a teacher, a classroom teacher, to a school administrator, to providing technical assistance for workshops that the Department of Education hosts. Uh, but he has also done, as a private consultant, grant training and grant guidance. In fact, he has done grant seminars that stretch over in one or two full days. But we've asked him to condense the one or two full days into an hour presentation uh, with you folks today. Uh, so he's going to try to zip through it, but we'll also have an opportunity for you to ask some questions of him as he goes forward. I encourage you to challenge him. That's what we like for you to do. Uh, and uh, that I hope you will uh, take away some, some tips on how to make your applications and your seeking resources more competitive in a very competitive environment. So, Dr. Jeff Schwartz. Good morning. I'm going to get a few things set up here on the computer. As Guy introduced me as a former consultant, you know that consultants can get a little bit long-winded. And if I run out of time at the end for questions, that would be a shame. So I'm going to encourage you that as we go along, if a question comes to mind, please raise your hand. I've asked two of my colleagues, Sue and Carrie, to bring the microphones around to the front or the back so that we can make this more of a conversation as Guy introduced it. I also want to point out that we do have handouts coming for all of these slides that you're going to see. FedEx got delayed in Memphis, so they're not here yet. They should be here by lunch. Don't ask me why it goes from Washington to Charleston by way of Memphis. And they all will be posted on the ARC website shortly after this, conference, after this session if um, they're not there already. However, people sitting behind the pillars may find it difficult to move. So I'm going to encourage you to shift your chairs about. And anybody who moves up to the front desk, front tables here, does not have to take the written exam at the end of the session. I view grant writing as a process. It's actually not a grant writing process, but it's a program development process. Grants are just one of the resources that you're going to need to get something going in a community. I'm an educator. I'm going to use education as my examples. But this is true whether you're trying to put in an, um, an industrial park, a water tower, or whatever it is you need for your community. A grant is just one means of getting the resources that you need. I'm going to encourage you to focus on what those resources are, but first in figuring out what your needs are. I can't do a two-day workshop in one hour, so I do have to prioritize. I'm going to talk a little bit. You can't see the shades of gray too well up there. I'm going to mention all of the topics. I'm going to talk a little bit more about articulating outcomes and locating resources, one of which is funding, a very important resource. And I'm going to talk a lot about developing a proposal, a written proposal. And in the bottom of the slides, you're going to see, I'm going to keep this here so we can keep on track. You'll see where we're going, where we are, where we've been. Before you get started and say, I need some money. We've got to improve the community. I, why? Why do you need money? And the first question you need to ask is, what is the status quo? Where are we now? Do we have this community where we want it to be? Do we have all the resources we want? Do we have the tax base that we need to do the things we want to do? And if the answer is no, we're not where we want to be, we're not the community that we would like to be, what do we need? where do we want to be 10 years from now? Where do we want to go? And knowing where you want to go before you start is great. When I was in college, I took a year off to travel. It didn't matter where I went or what road I took to get there. I got where I was. We don't have that much time, and we don't have unlimited money. 
So know where you want to go, and then we're going to talk about plotting the most direct line to get there. Figure out where you are, know where you want to go, and then take a step back and look at exactly where you are and quantify everything. Because that is going to be key. That we have a culture in funders right now, public and private both, that want everything quantified. They want your outcomes. They want your objectives on paper. And they want you to take those measurements quarterly to make sure you're making progress towards them. So step back and look. Do we have enough workers with the right training to support the employers that we need to make this community thrive? Do we have adequate resources? Do we have the infrastructure, whether it be water, highways, telecommunications? Do we have what we need for this community to thrive and make progress and continue doing so? And if you don't have enough, how much more do you need? That is a key question. I work with workforce training. We've seen a lot of people come up with different numbers. The average number that I hear is about 80% of all new jobs that are going to be coming open in the next 10 to 15 years are going to require at least one year of training or education beyond high school. Do you have enough workers? that meet those qualifications? And do you have enough of your young people graduating high school and then continuing on to something? I'm an educator. I believe education is great, but not everybody needs a doctorate or even a bachelor's. But everybody should have at least one year of training beyond high school to get the jobs that are going to help them support a family, help them support the community. Okay. Once you figure out where you are, where you want to go, then you've got to develop your milestones that show you're getting there. You've got to develop the outcomes. At ARC, we talk about outcomes. And I'm going to mention a little bit more when we get into proposal development, proposal writing. You need to use the language of the agency or the group that you're talking to. So I'm going to talk about outcomes. Other agencies might call them objectives. Sometimes they're called the results or the impact. I talk about outcomes at ARC. And we actually talk about a few different things, but all of them, whatever you call them, have certain characteristics. If you can't see it, you can't measure it. And if you can't measure it, how do you know you've done anything? Not to say that some of those soft intangibles are not important, they are, but we need to translate them into terms that we can measure. We need to know how many kids are graduating high school. We can count those diplomas. We can count how many more diplomas we're issuing this year than we did last year. And it needs to be a specific number. We want to have more kids graduating high school. We want to have an increase in the number of bachelor's degrees awarded. How many more? Make it a specific number. But be realistic. If you've got 100 kids graduating high school, how many of them are going to go on to a bachelor's degree? Not 100, but we don't need all 100 to go on to a bachelor's. Some will get an associate, some will get a certificate. And focus on the results. It doesn't matter really how you're going to get there. Keep your focus on the, for education and training on the students, the workers, the businesses. Think about what it is they're going to be able to do. And it doesn't matter whether you're buying computers, whether you're buying electronics equipment, whether you're buying um, a toolkit for them to learn something. It's what are they going to be able to do once they get that training. The goal is not to buy a computer. The goal is to get this person into a job. And if buying a computer is going to do it, great. In some areas, it's going to be buying a new suit of clothes for people. Paying for childcare so that they can attend classes. Whatever it takes, the goal is the same, to get them a job. Okay. Here's an example, a specific example. And just to show that I'm not biased or overly biased towards education and training, I have some other examples in other areas. 
keep the focus on what the companies will be able to do and the improvements that they're going to be able to make. Think about where your community is and where they need to be. In economic development, there's a very big push now on creating new jobs, retaining the existing ones, and creating new ones. We want to look at export development, but it's also true for infrastructure. We know we're going to need more drinking water. We know we're going to need more um, broadband connectivity. But the end result is that businesses can grow. We can bring new businesses in. Development continues. We get more jobs, more people at work, and the community thrives. Keep your eye on that end goal. That is key. Let me see if I can start using this clicker. I forgot I had it there. Program design, I did my entire master's degree on program design. You don't want to get me started there. But if, we do, if you do have questions, go ahead. What I suggest is that you bring in all the players. You can't please everybody, but if they've all been invited to the table, they're going to be a lot more supportive. They're going to be a lot more helpful. And they're going to help you get where you need to be. Grant makers and ARC is no different. I think you talk to foundations, they're going to view themselves in the same way. We see ourselves as investors. Right now, I'm looking a lot at my retirement fund. I'm thinking, hey, this is, I'm getting to the age where it's a reality and I might be able to do it with a little bit of luck. Think about your retirement investments. If you're younger and it's not a reality and money is still unlimited, yeah, you're going to take some risks. You put it in that high-risk fund that maybe it'll become another Microsoft and just keep tripling every year until you retire and you can retire at age 40. As you get older, though, money is more limited. Time is more limited. You become more conservative. And investors want to go with something that's tried and true. Well, we're in a financial and an economic situation right now where money is very limited. And foundations businesses, government agencies no longer have these endless pools of money from which to draw from and throw around. And so we're looking at our investments. And if you're going to make an investment, are you going to go for something that's risky, that's never been tried before? Maybe it'll have great returns. Maybe nothing. We don't know. Or do you go for that tried and true investment that you know is going to work? That you know will get you the funding that you need to safely retire 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. I don't know if you can see that dot. Your first choice in a program, unless you have enough money to fund it yourself, your first choice, the easiest thing to find the resources for is something that you've proven has already worked someplace very similar to where you are. Now, no two places are exactly alike. So, your second choice, if necessary, is you adapt something that has been proven to work. The last resort, the last resort, the last thing you want to do is create a wheel. We've got a lot of wheels out there, folks. A lot of people spent a lot of time developing all these wheels to get different types of transportation moving. I think we can find one that's going to work. Maybe if we just tweak it a little bit, It'll work where you are. And I think you'll find that if you're doing something that's tried and true, tried and proven, you'll be able to find it a lot easier to get resources. Okay. Now let's talk about resources and what it is you need to get going. Just as I said with the outcomes, you want to keep your eye focused on what you really need. Most of us think, I need money. Just give me more money and I can get it done. Well, we don't have any more money, I'm sorry. But we have access to resources. What is it that you need? Think about where that is. And a lot of the resources that you need to work with are located in your community. I'm talking about not just money. We'll talk a little bit about maybe where it might be hidden in your communities as well as in the federal bureaucracy. But people and services. Those are the three key resources we need to get most things done in this world. 
Think about where they're located in your towns, your counties, your state, in your communities. Who's got control of them? Make a list. Make an actual list. Don't just do this in your head. And don't try to do it alone. Sit around a table and brainstorm. Think about all those resources and then write them down in one column. Even resources that you think you may not need yet. Let's say your town has an agency or a company that does sign interpretation for hearing impaired. Well, you may not have any clients or students who need that service yet, but when you do need it, you want to know where that resource is. Write it down. There's a local bank. Most banks have a little trust department when people gather money. It's not enough to set up our own family foundation. They don't want to go through all that. They deposit it in the bank in a trust fund and say, you know what? If we have any kids from this school who want to study nursing, use this money as a scholarship. If somebody wants to start a little arts program, use this trust fund for that purpose. We'll find out where those trust funds are located and then write down who controls it. Who's the vice president at that bank in charge of their trust department? Who's the director of that sign interpretation services? Who sits on the right committee at the town council, the county council, the state legislature that controls the funding or the resources that you think you might need access to? And then how are you connected to them? Now, I know it's a small town, but you may not know everybody. West Virginia seems to be connected wherever I go. People, oh, you know someone, you've been there, you know someone, so yeah. But think about how you're connected to whoever the controller is. And that's your end. If your wife works with her husband and her husband has control over the resource that you need, you've got a connection. Seven degrees of separation, well, it's usually only two or three degrees at most in some of our communities. The people that you're going to need are going to serve all sorts of roles. If you're going out there, most things you don't want to undertake by yourself. If one person could do it, they probably would have already. So you're going to want to gather people around you. If you're getting a large project going, you probably want to have a board of directors, maybe even a board of advisors. You're going to have different committees to take on different tasks. Consultants, that's not a dirty word, folks. I was one for a number of years. Sometimes they're handy to have. Interns can be a mixed blessing. ARC got very lucky this summer. We had a couple of interns who did some great work. They really accomplished something. But even though some interns may require a lot of supervision and you think it's, they might be more work than it's worth, if you're getting interns from a local college or university and you give them something to do for a while and you train them and you mentor them along, well, when you need space to have a large community meeting or you need space to host a training or you need a computer and projector and other facilities, that college or university is going to remember that you gave their students a chance, and they owe you one. Loaned executives. Lots of people out there have a lot of great expertise, and you may not need a corporate CEO with a seven, eight, nine-figure salary to work for you full time. But maybe you can borrow their expertise for a period of time. Many, if you're doing some sort of programs, you might have program participants, volunteers. These are all people that are the resources you need to locate in your communities. The services that you frequently need. Um, these are just some of them. They're listed pretty much in alphabetical order, not order of priority. Depending upon what you're doing, most of us need some sort of printing service. We could have used a little better package delivery service yesterday <laughs> to get our materials here. Whatever it is, telecommunications, training, transportation, all those services are things that we need to get various types of programs going. Now, you may or may not need all of them for your program, or you may not need them now, but take note of what is there. Because when you need it, 
you don't want to have to go running for it. You want to know where it is and how to access it. Money. When you're trying to raise money, how many of you are independently wealthy and don't need any more? Oh, we had one hand there. <laughs> Wishful thinking doesn't count. doesn't get us there. Again, note that these sources of raising funds, and most of them are local, except for investments. I had them in alphabetical order, and I stopped halfway through the alphabet. Lots of ways to get creative. We're going to be focusing on this one here, grants. I'm going to be focusing mostly on public grants from the federal government. But I do want to talk about some of these other sources of money, especially grants from private sector. The federal government has been falling on hard times the past couple of years. It's no secret that all the budgets have been cut back. That's impacted the state budgets, which have also been cut back. The, federal se the private sector has stepped into it. And they've come up with it. Now, this data is a little bit old. The current data that I've found separates government out from all of these other sources. I like using this because I want you to see the proportion of where the funding comes from. Fees and tuition or fee for services. If you have a nonprofit, you've got more office space than you need, you can rent that out and get money. If you run an educational program, you charge tuition, you can get money. That's where most nonprofits get their funding. Private sources, government, endowments and investments. We always hear about universities raising billions, with a B, billions of dollars for their endowments. But when they're taken all together, that really is only a small portion for nonprofit funding. But we can look at private sources and government. Let's look at private first. What do you think is the number one source of private funding for a nonprofit? Anybody? What? Individuals. Almost three fourths of the money comes from individuals. And this data, by the way, is a lot more recent. This is from 2010 data. Everyone thinks, well, Microsoft, they've got all the money. They're doing all the funding. Corporations and corporate foundations do 5% of total giving. Bequests, what people leave in their will after they die, a little bit more, 8%. We get into foundations. And we're starting to talk about some real money there. But that's only 14% of the private giving. Individuals. Interesting thing about individuals and the statistic that always amazes me, the lower the income, the higher the proportion of it they give away. On average, the lower the income, the more of that income people give away. And a good amount of this is collected on plates every Sunday in church. There are two different types of funding we talk about in the development world, long-term and short-term. They are not the same, and they have different sources. You need to keep this in mind, that when you're looking at running a program, you've got to have long-term funding. Short-term funding is usually for a one-shot deal, an immediate need, but don't confuse short-term with immediate. Because if you need the money now, it's too late. In general, now, if there's an emergency, we've done this a lot at ARC, and we need to give an emergency grant because of a flood or a tornado, an earthquake, we can generally turn that around in about a week or less. If something happens on Monday at ARC, we can have the funding out there Friday. We've seen while FEMA has taken a little bit of um, criticism over the years, I think we've seen in the recent tornadoes this past spring, within three days, they're on the ground with the resources needed immediately. That is unusual and reflective of an emergency circumstance. In general, you need to think about a one-year timeline. From the time you first start putting together an application, you send a letter of inquiry, 
until you get that check in hand, think of a one-year process. Now, a lot of private funders can do it in six months or maybe less. It depends upon if you hit the right cycle with the board meetings. Think about a one-year process. And you want to use short-term funding to start something new, expand what you've got, or meet an emergency. It's not for ongoing operations. And most of us, by us, I mean most funders now, are starting to ask, okay, that's great. After we give you the startup money, how are you going to keep things going? What's your sustainability plan? Grant funding, that's where we're going to start our focus right now, is short-term only. It's not an entitlement, and I know we sometimes confuse those in the federal world, but it's just one-shot deal, not for ongoing operations. But if you don't have your long-term plan in place first, you're not going to get that short-term funding. If you don't tell the funder how you're going to keep that daycare center operating, how are you going to pay for that broadband connectivity once you've got that fiber optic wire strung? How are you going to implement that computer training once the computers are bought and paid for? If you don't have that second step in place, the first step is going to be a lot harder to reach. What is your long-term funding plan? Okay. Let's get into money. When I was a consultant, I did a lot of talking to people about fundraising versus friend raising. Knowing the right people will get you a lot further in this world than not knowing them. And friend raising is very, very important. It's a highly critical component to any development process. While you're here, I'd encourage you to swap cards with everybody. I'd also encourage you to don't be shy. Take the opportunity to talk to the federal speakers, especially those who came from Washington, DC, because right around 3.30 when we end, we're all going to have to rush off to catch that last flight out of Yeager Airport. So don't be hesitant to ask questions during the talks, at lunch, after each session. Don't let them go, but make friends with people. Once we, people get to know each other, it becomes a lot easier to deal over the telephone or via distance. And it's no longer giving money to this community, this person. I have no idea who she is. Is she just going to spend my money on a trip around the world, or is she actually going to do something for her community? But if I know her, I've got a little bit more faith. And with public sector grants, when they're scored objectively and two people have the same score, there's going to be an impact with going with somebody that you know. Now, I'm from ARC. We give out federal money. Let's talk about giving out federal money. Your first stop in looking for a federal grant should be grants.gov. Now, that's your first stop. It's not your last. But your first stop ought to be grants.gov. Most, but not all, federal funding opportunities are up there. Don't ask me for what percentage. I don't know. Each agency is a little different. And not all agencies use grants.gov for all programs, because not all programs fit the cookie cutter of that particular system. I think if you go there and if you look up ARC, you'll see ARC is listed, and then it says contact the state person or the the agency directly. The way our system works going through the state process does not fit the grants.gov mold. Even if you're not applying for a federal grant, though, you might want to look at some of the resources that are up here. And I'm going to talk about what some of those resources are in just a minute. If you're in the federal system, this grants.gov website is going to be your first stop. And you'll notice that from this corner up here, I blew it, blew it up bigger so that even the people in the very back can read it. They're putting notifications up there. How many of you know what a DUNS number is? Very good. Digital Universal Numbering System. I actually had to Google that to figure out what DUNS stood for because I can never remember. 
How many of you know that if you have a Dunn's number, it expires at some time? I didn't know that until I got on grants.gov to prepare this presentation for today. And they had this little announcement that Dunn's numbers will expire. And beginning August 9th of this year, if your Dunn's number is expired, you can't even submit your application via grants.gov. And a lot of grants require that you go through grants.gov. Okay. We're going to go on. Some other things I want to point out. It says here, get registered. A lot of grants, before we go through, and I'll show you how to do a little bit of a quick search and some of the resources that are there. If you're going to apply through grants.gov, you have to be registered on grants.gov. It's free. They don't spam your inbox, although they will send you some notifications that are very handy. But you do need to register. When you go to register, <laughs> is that for me? When you go to register, you're going to need a lot of numbers. You're going to need your DUNS number, possibly your IEN, your employer EIN, employer identification number. You're going to need some other information about your agency that is usually not all kept in one office. And it never fails for me. Whenever I've gone on there with anybody to help them try to register, the system crashed. Or if it didn't crash, my connection slowed and we got timed out, I guess is a better way to put it. So register in advance before you need to do anything else. Um, you can apply for grants. You can track your application. However, if your application takes too long to go through the agency process, Grants.gov only keeps things on file for a maximum of six months, and sometimes they clear them out sooner. So if it's been there for four, five, or six months, and all of a sudden it disappears, that doesn't mean you were not funded. It just means you've timed out on the Grants.gov system, and you can't track it through there anymore. There are a lot of applicant resources that are very good. Grant writing proposal training material that will train you how to write up a good grant. There are lots of FAQs and user guides to help you get through. Their quarterly newsletter will include timely updates that say, just when you need to apply for this grant, we're going to take the system down for an update and maintenance. Subscribing to their updates is good. It comes out quarterly. Something else you can do, you also should subscribe to the grants.gov blog. People ask questions. They find mistakes up there. They put it into the blog. They get answers. They get corrections made. It's a very good way to find updates. Email grant alerts. You can have grants.gov save your searches. And then when new grants come in that hit your search parameters, they'll send you an email about those. If you're with a large um, planning and development center or a large university and you've got people who want grants in multiple areas, you can set grants.gov to send you an email alert about every single new grant that's posted up there. You may or may not want to do every single one, but they do have a lot. You can find resources from the grantors, which are all the federal different agencies. And those resources, if you're applying for a grant from the Department of Energy, from the Department of Labor, I think EPA, Department of Education, they all have resources, webinars online, training guides on how they want you to write the application for their agency. Go to that agency and take that online course. It'll take you probably anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours. Download the manuals. They'll tell you what you need to put into their applications and how they want you to write it. They'll tell you what sections to use what the rules are. And then do that. That's the way to get through. Okay. Let's say you want to just click on basic search for now. So I'm going to click on basic search. You get a screen that looks like this. Now my preference, of course, is to put in workforce training. I did this last week. The date will come up here in a minute. Let's see. I did this on October 4th, and at that time, there were 490 funding opportunities on grants.gov 
for the general broad category of workforce training. Almost every U.S. agency does some sort of workforce training. A lot of these may be overseas, they may be very technical, they may not be things that you would get locally, so you can then go through and refine your search. Um, I don't know if you can read that up there. I did wastewater just as one search term, just to show you what the opportunities are. Whoops, let's go back. Wastewater. Clicker's gotten away from me. There we go. Wastewater had 143 opportunities. If you need a sewage system, now some of these, this one happens to be a project in Chad. Not quite local in West Virginia, but then you can go through, you can search for domestic, you can search for different term parameters, and then you can save that search. But remember, grants.gov is only your first stop. Let me give you an example from ARC. If you go to our highlights page, our front page, and then you skim down, you'll see a highlight here that talks about an arrangement we have with Microsoft to give out $2 million worth of software in the ARC region. As a matter of fact, the announcement was made by Senator Rockefeller and, Sen and Senator Wicker from Mississippi. If you do your math, you'll figure out $2 million spread across 13 states. It's about $150,000 worth of software per state. This is not up on grants.gov because it's coming from Microsoft, not from us. It's a little different process, and most federal agencies will have different things that don't quite fit the grants.gov mold, they don't fit the grants.gov timelines, they don't fit the grants.gov application process. I don't know if you can read this back there, but you'll see here's a nice little $10,000 piece of server software. You can get all the Outlook software. Just about, this is the first half of the first of three pages of a list of software that Microsoft is making available. A few conditions. You need to be a nonprofit organization. Government, schools, hospitals, health services are not eligible for this software. But if you're interested, send an email to my colleague Mark DeFalco. Be aware that it is first come, first serve and that a lot has been given away. Not all. I'd say most of it's been given out, but not all. Shoot him an email. He will send you the application form, which is, I think, two or three, a uh, two or three page form that you fill out. The hardest part is listing exactly what software and which licenses you need. And he's been talking people through it. I don't know, you have to ask Mark question was, how long does a software license last? Um, that's a question for him to answer. I don't know. Um, if you're a library that's a local nonprofit organization, you're eligible. But if you're a county, city library, or a school library, you're not. Unlike most ARC grants, when we play the federal government and our legislation says we have to get a match. Well, the federal government gives us the money, they make the rules. In this case, it's Microsoft giving the software. They make the rules. They say there's no match required. There's about 150,000 per state on average. First come, first served. Contact them soon. You're going to do the email right now. I see that. He's going for the Blackberry. iPhone works too. Mark is in the office standing by. I warned him. When you're writing proposals, most of them, the one for Microsoft through ARC is a short three-page form. Most proposals are going to be a little bit longer. It's been my experience with the federal government that ARC probably has one of the shortest written proposals. If you're not doing construction, it's very simple. If you're doing construction, it's very complex. You don't want to take it on a loan. 
make it a team effort. And that's what we're going to talk about now is the last stage, proposal development. Again, bring back all of your stakeholders. Bring back the entire team. Get your community together. You're not going to get everybody around the table to, degree, to agree on one thing. But I assure you, if somebody was not invited to the table, they will fight you tooth and nail to the bitter end. Even after you've proven them right and you're proven them wrong and you're right, they will continue to fight. But if they've been invited to the table, they will, in most cases, eventually come around and be supportive. At the very least, they won't obstruct you. Tailor your pro proposal for each specific agency. My other federal colleagues are here from their agencies. What the Department of Education wants in theirs is different from what EPA wants in theirs, and it's different from what ARC wants, what we want in ours. The language is different. And please, don't just change the cover page and send in the same text. I hate to tell you how many times I've gotten a grant that the cover page said ARC proposal, and then inside it says um, Department of Education proposal or another agency. And as I mentioned when talking about outcomes, outcomes is the ARC term. You want to use the term that that agency uses. Get on their websites. Read their websites closely. Look at the language that they're using and parrot it back. Because if you use the same language that we use, it's going to be much easier for us to understand what you're saying. And it's going to feel like your program is a better fit with our agency. But if you use ARC terminology in a Department of Ed application, it won't feel as good to them as it does to me. Most agencies, and this is true for private as well as public, will tell you exactly what you need to put in your application. Exactly. They'll tell you how long it needs to be, what size font to use, whether it needs to be electronic or on paper, where and when to submit it. Make a detailed checklist. Well, first of all, read the request for proposals. Don't just start writing the proposal read that request, study everything online, make a detailed checklist of everything that needs to be in your proposal and put it in order. Use that checklist as your table of contents for organizing. If you're not sure of something, most agencies will have a contact person or an email address up there. If they give you a phone number, call. It's always nice to make a human connection. If they don't have a phone number, email. Ask. Don't just guess or assume. Even if you're pretty sure, you're 80, 90 percent sure, you know what that term means because you use it a lot. Well, I'm from Washington, D.C. I assure you, we don't use words any way the same that they use them out here. We always have our own meanings for them. Call and ask. A great resource to have is sources of funded proposals. Find a lot of them are made available online. Many agencies will publish or make available online the full documentation of everything that's in a winning proposal, except for perhaps the budget or salary page. Um, and if not, you can at least find out who got grants one year. Contact them, ask them for a copy of their proposal. Ask them for help in writing yours. When you submit a proposal, just because you've submitted it, you've met the deadline, doesn't mean you're done. It's an iterative process. You get submit your proposal, and how many of you are always successful the first time you try everything? Grant writing is the same. You send in a proposal, and it comes back and says, sorry, we had 10,000 applications. We could only fund two. Yours didn't make the cut. Fine. And then you get back to the agency about a week later and you say, could you please send me your comments and critique on the proposal? What could I do next time to make it stronger? Why did it not get funded? I only got 98 out of 100 points. What did I miss? And if they say, oh, you didn't include X, and you say, well, X was on page 7. It's too late for that. 
but next time you put a little call out there that says X is located here. And you do that in the margins on the side where you say, here's X, here's Y, here's Z. And keep it in the order that it's supposed to be in makes it easy for people to find. And then the next time you get it, your proposal, you get 99 out of 100. Ask for comments again. You find out, okay, this time they saw X, but they didn't see Y. So then you make Y stand out a little bit, or maybe you forgot to include Y, so you put that in. And then the third time or the fourth time, you get that perfect score of 100 points, and you get your grant. And it takes several iterations of going through. And once you do a proposal for one group, you can tweak it, change the language a little bit, but you've got the basic template that you can shop around. You've got work that you can use for other projects, for other things. You want to draft and redraft. And at the time, just before, if you can, finish your proposal, whether it be electronic or on paper, finish it about a week before you need to submit it. Find somebody who knows very little or nothing about the work you're doing, who knows nothing about the request for proposals, who is very good at reading and critiquing, and will give you some honest feedback, whether it be positive or negative. One of my friends used to say, well, that's what my ex-wife is for. But you need somebody who's going to look at it with a fresh eye, who's going to say, oh, I didn't see this. Or the grammar here is a little funny, or you spelled this wrong, or you ought to change this or highlight that, or what does that mean? Get an outside review, an outside perspective. Now, as we talk about, or as I talk about proposal development, have you noticed a common theme through all these slides? Follow the directions. About 20% of all applications submitted never get read. When I first came to ARC about 11 years ago, I sat down with some friends and some new friends who I used to be on the other side of the grant making table. Now that I was on the grant door side of the table, I sat down with some folks that worked at foundations that I had worked with. And these were grant makers that had, were giving away, 11 years ago, they were giving away a lot more money than they are now. And I started having a conversation with them about common errors. And one gentleman who asked that I not mention his foundation, but he says, the big thing is, he has somebody that sits at a mail desk. They have an intern that they pay with a special ruler and she measures to make sure that there's a one inch margin around every edge of the paper and that the people used a 12 point font and that it is no more than 20 pages. And he says, if they don't follow that, if they don't have a 12 point font, they'll get a nice postcard from that intern that says, thank you for submitting your proposal. If we decide to fund it, we'll be in touch with you later. And they will never hear from that foundation again. And I looked at him and I said, why? What is so important about a 12-point font? Why is that so critical? He says, well, if they can't follow directions that simple and that basic, how do I know they can use my money well? And it's not like he was the head of the foundation, but that's how people feel. If you can't do something as simple as follow the 12-point font direction, submitting online or via mail, whichever is required, then you're not going to be able to follow directions for administering a grant. Read the directions first. Then do what they say. Um, these are some of the key things that get projects or get proposals kicked out. Be very aware of your language. I'm very aware that I am a Washington native. My first language is acronyms. And then when I come up and I start speaking about my field, which is education and training, I get into jargon there. But I am very aware that when I'm in a more diverse setting, that I can't always use my favorite acronyms and jargon. And we need to be very aware of the language. Be very aware that the terminology that you use in your hometown may not be understood anyplace else that you may have some words or language or a way of expressing something that is not 
part of what linguists would term standard English, or at least not English the way I learned it in school. And since you don't know who's going to read your proposal, and it's probably not the woman sitting next to you who grew up next to you and speaks the same language you do, watch your grammar, your English, use of jargon, and please don't make me learn new acronyms. I spent 12 years in school getting all my education. I'm done learning. So if you have an organization or a name for your project, spell it out. Don't make the reviewer work harder than is absolutely necessary because it sets up a psychological block. Follow the directions. Get it in on time. Make sure that everything is there. If you look at proposals that have been funded before by that agency, and you notice that all those proposals tend to have nice graphs that show data in pictorial form, put your data in picture form. If you look at a lot of HHS proposals, I haven't looked at one for a few years, but when I was a consultant, all of them used to have tables of data attached in the back. Well, if you're writing a proposal, you better have those tables of data. Whatever it is that that agency tends to like is what you want to include. And you can't overstate the necessity of reading the proposal, figuring out exactly what it is they want, and then giving them that. And again, that independent review is really, really critical. Persevere. Like I said, it's an iterative process. You submit one year, it comes back, it doesn't get funded, submit it again. It comes back, you get the comments on it, you get other people to review it, find out why, change it, submit it again, or, and submit it to a different agency. Change the language for that agency, submit it again. One of the things that was interesting, in a story I'll tell, down in Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, one of the planning development districts down there put together a proposal, a very large proposal looking at their entire workforce for a tri-state area in Alabama, um, Tennessee, and Georgia. And they su submitted a big proposal, I think it was to EDA, the Economic Development Administration. My acronyms are coming out again. It didn't get funded for whatever reason. But because they had already done that work, and they had all that information, that was some of the key data that was supplied to Volkswagen, which is just completing their new American plant in the Chattanooga area. Gathering the data, articulating what it is you want and need to do in your community is always a good thing. And if you're not successful with your first proposal, then your second or third or fourth, or in some other way, such as having the information there and having it well articulated, will be a very good use to you and will be a very successful project for you. Now, it seems like everybody was shy. Nobody stood up to ask questions. So we've got 10 minutes at the end. I'd like to invite you to ask questions, to testify some experiences that you've had on your own. And I'm also going to ask that you come use a microphone. We're, we are taping this. Um, but if you could, oh, Sue, could you grab the mic? It should just pop out. And if you could just let people know where you're from, who you are, where you're from, that'd be great. There's a switch on the side. How about now? Oh, yes. Okay, I'm Gail Patton. I'm from Huntington, West Virginia. I'm the executive director of a business incubator in Huntington. And my question is, you said that we should take a year to come up with a proposal and spend time doing planning and getting it together. But a lot of the grants don't even come out that they're available and they have a very short time frame, a month and a half sometimes, two right. months. How do we deal with that? My suggestion is that you look at what's coming. If you look at, again, Department of Education is where I look the most, that's where I'm most familiar with. If you look at the legislation that's been proposed and is just now starting to be heard, the president proposed it, it's just now starting to be heard in Congress, they're talking about changing NCLB, they're talking about the Jobs Act, which includes funding for community colleges. Take a look at what's coming and start preparing for it. Follow the debates in, the in Congress, follow the debates in your state legislature, have it all ready. 
once you've written one proposal, you've got the, ba the basics of who you are, what your capacities are, they're there. You may have to tweak some of the language a little bit, but you've got that template. Um, oftentimes, you're addressing one big need with several ways. You might come in for a proposal for computers to do some training. Another proposal that will help you with curriculum development. Well, the basic need statement is there. You pull that together. But yes, federal proposals often come out with a 30, 60, 90 day deadline. You need to be ready before it's released. Keep an eye out also on the Federal Register. Sometimes, often on grants.gov, but in the Federal Register, they'll put out the RFP for comment before it's opened for bids. Look at that and then pay attention to the comments they get because the agencies do react and modify because of those. Yeah, I'm Dawn Seberger. I own Environmental Resources and Consulting. In response to her question, one of the things you can look at is some of the federal agencies come out with these same grants year after year. I do a lot of work with EPA and the Brownfields program, so if you look at last year's guidance document, you can prepare your application following that guidance and then just tweak it when the new guidance comes out because usually there's just minor changes that you have to address. And a lot of times most of these grant applications you're applying for really want the same information. So your demographics, your you know, uh, you know, how many people are educated in your community, you know, what's the graduate degree level, what's their you know moderate income. There's a lot of information you can use over and over again as has been reiterated here. But the biggest thing is, and I've written a lot of grants here in West Virginia, primarily again for EPA Brownfields, about three or four million dollars I've brought into the state so far. But really what you have to do is be able to tell a good story. And that story has to be understandable by the person who's reviewing it. If they don't understand the message that you're trying to get across, they're not going to fund your grant. So you really have to make them visualize you know, the poverty, the, you know, the brownfields, whatever it is that you're going after, why you have that need. And yes, those deliverables, the objectives are all very important. Very good point. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cindy. I'm with the Robert C. Byrd Institute in Huntington, West Virginia. And I kind of wanted to reiterate a little, or maybe take a little bit farther what she just said. Um, like you, you said in the very beginning, when you sit down with your stakeholders, your, your project partners and so forth, you have to establish your baseline. You kind of look at your own goals and objectives. But the one thing that I've found, and I've, I've written grants, I'm older than dirt, but anyway, uh, for a long, long time, is you have to go beyond not just what the RFP says and what it's looking for in the objective. You have to dig a little deeper, like for example, in education, you have to see what no child left behind. Or like if you're writing a DHS grant, you know, when, when I start out building my logic model, trying to get the tasks and trying to get the objectives and goals, you have to pair them up with the source of the funding, like the Stafford Act for FEMA, for some of the Department of Homeland Security. Those federal acts are actually the core of where that money is coming from. So, I mean, you have to include that in your, your objectives and goals, too. Show us how this funding is going to help us meet our goals and our mission. Exactly. I do have a question for you, yeah. though, and, and it, it's kind of a simple one. Um, it's been debated for years and years and years, is what, when you're talking about the voice of your proposal, I mean, I always write with a stronger voice in the third person. A lot of people say we, I, you know, us. And I believe if you use your name over and over and over again, like the Robert C. Byrd Institute, instead of saying us or we, that's a stronger proposal. And the Oxford comma thing, too. That's another thing that's always been up to It's been my experience that that varies with the culture of the organization. And I would say look at grants that that organization or that agency has funded in the past and follow the pattern that's there. Um, at the risk of stereotyping, some of the more scientific organizations, NSF, for example, their winning applications tend to be written in the third person, more of a scientific voice. Any other questions or comments? Sue's behind you with a microphone. 
My name is Mary Lou Pratt, and I'm with Cabell County Public Library in Huntington. And I just want everyone to know of the resources of the Foundation Center, because um, the Foundation Center in New York City makes um, various libraries can apply to become a cooperating collection, meaning that they get free databases that are available in their library. Kanawha County Library is a cooperating collection. Uh, Cabell County is one. And they have a really good website called grantspace.org. And that website has tutorials and podcasts on how to write grant proposals. And um, uh, the, if you get into one of the libraries, if you go to the Foundation Center website, which you could just look Foundation Center, then it, it gives you a little map and you can find out the cooperating collection that's closest to your area. And if you use, if you get into the, the, foundations, the foundation center has a lot of useful information, but the libraries that are the cooperating collections give you a lot more detail. You can get in and actually see 990 forms, which is um, one thing that every, everyone, everyone that gives money has to fill out a 990 form. So it's just a resource that not everyone is aware of. It's a federal tax regulation that if you're a foundation and you don't want to pay taxes and you're giving money away, you have to fill out a federal 990. And the Foundation Center has that collection online. If you're a member, you can get it online. If you're not a paying member of the Foundation Center, you go to one of their collect, co collaborative li collaborating libraries. You can view it there. And they're also a great place to start for your searching for private funds. They are, to the foundation world, what grants.gov is to the federal world. Sue? Could you hold on, wait for the mic? One other real quick comment, and this is in regards to grants.gov. Do not uh, think that you're going to be able to necessarily submit as of the day it's due. Last year in the spring, Grant Scott Dove crashed on the day that the HUD DOT grants were due. Be prepared to send these things out FedEx if necessary. So don't always count on being able to submit on grants.gov. Just a you know, just a real quick you know idea, but you really need to be prepared to do that. Yes, you do. Keep everything on a paper backup. If the system crashes, agencies will accept an overnight FedEx. But it's even better if you can send it in the day or two beforehand. What happens is everybody accesses the system at the same time. And for major applications, it really slows down. Take one more question. I'm, I'm Norm Schwartfeger, uh, West Virginia University. And I thought your reference earlier to a year was more like be prepared from the time you begin filling your application out. Yes. That you have a year before your project's going to come to fruition, you're going to get your funding. I've done a couple of federal grants, and my experience has been multiple years sometimes. It can take a number of years before you really get your project all the way through and ready to go. And uh, so I just think people need to realize that if their project is one ready to go and you're using federal funds, it may be a while, it may really slow your project up because uh, those resources take some time to get through. Yeah, one year is, in my experience, the average. Well, in the interest of keeping things on time, I think we'll stop the questions and discussions there. I want to thank everybody for your time. These handouts will be available later today as soon as FedEx gets here. We'll have them out, hopefully, by lunch, and they will also be online. My full contact information is here. If you have any further questions, don't hesitate to shoot me an email. Thank you.